Today we're going to be dealing with H.G. Wells, the diamond maker. He is better known as a science fiction writer. Even this, the diamond maker that we're going to deal with, he deals with mineralogy or the making of diamonds. Diving straight into the content, our narrator was in Chancery Lane uh, because of some business in London. And after working for such a long time, he got tired and to rest his eyes, he went outside to watch the river. And he describes the beauty of the river saying that since it was dark, the darkness, the merciful darkness covered the dirt that was floating on the river during daytime. He was watching the variegated lights that were dancing on the river, on the street lights and the lights from the stars shone on the surface of the river. He watched how the colorful lights dancing on the river surface beautified the Waterloo Bridge of the Westminster. He was simply watching the peaceful river as the motion of the ripples time and again disturbed the peaceful surface of the river. As he was staring at the beauty of this river, someone came next to him and told him, it's a warm night. Before saying anything, the narrator looked at him to see whether he was talking to him or not. And the stranger was still looking at him. It means that he was talking to him. And his first impression about the stranger. Remember this, the first impression of our narrator upon seeing the stranger was that he had a sharp face and not unhandsome, that means he was not ugly. He did not look like a thief, a thug or a roux with his coat collar buttoned till the top. At first our narrator thought that if he talked to this stranger, maybe he will have to take this stranger home and give him shelter or even feed him breakfast. Because or else why would a stranger come and talk to you in such a busy place like Westminster in such a busy town? Why would someone come and approach you? And before replying back to him, our narrator thought, is this man even worth talking to? Is this man worth my time? But looking at him, he had this quality of intelligence on his forehead and his nether lip which decided him that, yeah, I think it is okay to talk to him. So our narrator replied back saying that, yes, it is warm, but just for now, we cannot stay out here all night. The stranger agreed and then said that it is so nice to see a peaceful place like this, a peaceful river like this in the middle of a busy town where everyone is so busy and time is so hectic and everyone is rushing towards your own business. It is so peaceful. Then the stranger continued to tell our narrator that uh, you must be a gentleman or else you wouldn't be in a busy place like this. The stranger continued saying that ah, sometimes I feel like I don't, I don't even really know whether it, my business is worth the candle. I doubt whether my hard labor is even worth wasting my life for. But then again, I've wasted so much time on my business. I've wasted so much of my life into my business that if I quit, I will have nothing but regret. When this man was talking about this big business and stuff, our narrator looked at him in shock. Because this stranger who was talking about big business and stuff, he looked like the most hopeless man he had ever seen in his life. He was dirty and he was dressed in rags. He was untidy and unshaven. He looked as though he had been left in the dustbin for over a week. Our narrator thought that maybe this guy is crazy or maybe he's just making fun of his poverty. Our narrator replied to him wisely and indirectly saying that, okay, if high aims and if high ambition needs hard labor and sacrifice, it also gives us back the power to do good to other people. And also, if you have high aims and high business and high position, people will notice you in your outlook, in your appearance, in the way you look and in the way you dress. The stranger, he understood what our narrator wanted to tell him, what he was indirectly saying. The stranger simply said that, I forgot myself. I was not always like this, but you wouldn't understand. I have a very big business at hand, but I have problems just right now. In fact, to tell you the truth, I make diamonds. Now, our narrator had been living in London for a long time, so he has known so many cheaters and how people have been cheated. So, obviously, he did not believe 
I'm tired of being disbelieved, said the stranger. And quickly unbuttoning his coat, he took out a small canvas bag, opened it and pulled out a brown pebble, brown stone. He asked our narrator, do you know what this is? In the past, our narrator had studied a little bit about physics and mineralogy, so he quickly took the pebble and started examining it. Remember how he examined the pebble. The narrator found out that that brown pebble was not like an unpolished diamond. It, it looked like an unpolished diamond, but it was a little dark. And if it really was a diamond, then it was a behemoth of a diamond. It was a large diamond. It was as large as the top of his thumb. And it was a regular octahedron. That means eight sided like a diamond. He took the pebble pulled out his pen knife and tried to scratch it one small scratch and tried to examine it with his watch glass underneath the lamp light the narrator was surprised to see that it looked like a diamond he wasn't sure but it looked like a diamond so he asked the diamond maker where did you get it so the diamond maker said i told you i made it come on give it back to me and the diamond maker he was also he wanted to trust our narrator but could not the narrator on the other hand wanted to trust that the, this diamond maker really made diamonds but he wasn't so sure he couldn't trust there was trust issue the diamond maker took back the diamond and put it back in the canvas bag and hurriedly closed it up after putting away the diamond the diamond maker told our narrator that look i will give you this diamond for 100 pound Hearing the word 100 pound, the suspicion of our narrator returned back. Because why would a person sell a diamond and a behemoth of a diamond at such a cheap price as 100 pound? Then the narrator thought that it might just be a corundum. It might not be original. The narrator looked at the diamond maker in suspicion and wanting to believe. On the other hand, the diamond maker looked at our narrator eagerly wanting him to believe what he was saying at times like this it could be an opportunity of a lifetime for the narrator or it could be just someone trying to dupe him trying to fool him and after all they did not know each other they were strangers to each other both of them the narrator thought that okay though a hundred pound is cheap for a diamond but still if he if he had to give if he had to buy the diamond at a hundred pound, then it would leave a visible gap in his fortune. And also it would only be a fool who would buy diamond at night without having proper proof whether it is truly a diamond or not, just by examining it with a pen knife and under the gas lamp. But then again, if that diamond was a real diamond, then it would conjure, it would stir up someone's fortune into a millionaire and also all his life he had never heard about the existence of such a big diamond he had also heard that there is you know the kafir selling diamonds in the black market so it was very hard for him to decide whether he should buy that diamond or not whether it was an opportunity of a lifetime or whether it was just someone trying to fool him our narrator was speechless. He could not say anything. So he just asked the diamond maker, how did you get it? Then the diamond maker told him that I made it. Then the narrator started to think that, okay, I've heard about Moison, who used to talk about artificial diamonds, you know, not naturally made, but men making diamonds by themselves. But if that diamond was made by that diamond maker, then it was too big. Artificial diamonds are small and tiny. People have yet not been able to make a large diamond. The diamond maker noticed how this narrator had tried to score a fine line on the diamond and tried to, uh, tried to check, tried to examine whether it was real or not. So he continued to say that, okay, you look like someone who knows a little bit about these diamonds and all. So let me tell you. And maybe after that you will decide whether you want to buy or not, diamonds are to be made by throwing out carbon from the combination in a flux and under certain temperature. The carbon crystallizes out, not as black lead or charcoal, but as small diamonds. This process that the diamond maker said 
is something that we have studied in class 9 or 10. Do you remember about crystallization? The process of crystallization? Maybe you remember, maybe you don't remember, but that was what he was talking about. The diamond maker told the narrator that many chemists have known this theory, but no one has so far hit the right flux or the right pressure for the result as such as big diamonds like this. And that is why artificial diamonds are small and worthless as jewel, the diamond maker said. He continued to tell our narrator that I have given my life into this problem. All my life I cannot think about anything else except making diamonds. I began to be obsessed with diamond making and I was obsessed with how to make diamonds since I was 17 years old. And now I'm 32. For 15 years he had worked in the diamond making business. And finally, he, maybe he hit the right flux as to have such a big diamond as the top of his thumb. Ever since he started at the age of 17, he decided that it is worth his life. He was ready to sacrifice his life into the business of diamond making for 10 years or 20 years. It didn't matter to him. But what matters most was that he should be able to hit the right flux and he should be successful. And if he succeeded in making diamonds like that, then he would have millions of money. He would become a millionaire. That was his dream. And then he looked at the narrator and says, to think that I am at the verge of becoming a millionaire and still, I am still unsuccessful. He tells the narrator about how he started making diamonds and what problems he had to face. He started early trying to make diamonds, but then the problem, the main problem, as he says, was to keep things secret. Because if he, while in the process of making diamonds, before becoming successful, if he told other people that he is making diamonds, then other people would be influenced by his idea and then they would start making diamonds and he says that I don't pretend to be a knowledgeable person. I know very less about this but there are people who know more than me. So if I open up my secret that it is possible to make diamonds then they would be far ahead of me and for me it is necessary to make a pile of diamonds until I open up my secret that I can make diamonds. He talks about his first experiments and his failures. And he had nothing, no luxury in his life. All the money that he got, all the money that he received, he put it in diamond making. He rented a small room and in that room there was nothing except his apparatus, his instruments of making diamonds and his diamond making area. At first he tried being a teacher but then he says that I only have degree in chemistry, so it was not possible for me to teach anymore. He did different kinds of works to earn precious little money to keep his experiment going on. Three years ago, he said that I almost hit the flux. I almost made diamonds, but failed. I got a gun barrel, filled it up with carbon composition, and filling it up with water, I sealed it tightly and I started heating it up and it failed. It burst and smashed all my windows, damaged almost all of my apparatus, but still I found this diamond powder. So it was not a total failure. I knew that I was about to reach my dreams. I found some researchers of Dobry and found out how he exploded dynamite and found that it was helpful to me. I got a cylinder just like him. In that cylinder, I stuffed in all my explosives, sealed it tightly, burned my furnace, put my sealed cylinder inside, and then I went out for a walk. 